Okay, let's start first with the deductive reasoning. So, in deductive reasoning, you begin with the general theory about something. For example, all birds have wings. Okay, now from this theory, you derive a more specific hypothesis that you can test. For instance, swans have wings. Then, in observation and data analysis, you then make observations or collect data relevant to the hypothesis. For example, you observe swans at a lake. And then finally, you draw a conclusion. You draw a conclusion based on your observations. For example, you conclude that since every swan you observed had wings, so your hypothesis is supported. So, in deductive reasoning, you start with the theory. You make a hypothesis, you observe and then conclude. But in inductive reasoning, you start with an observation. You start with a specific observation or data. For example, you notice that every swan you see at the lake has wings, for example. So, so you start with an observation. And then, from these observations, you develop a hypothesis. You might hypothesize that all swans have wings. And then, based upon this hypothesis, you develop a theory. After collecting more data and confirming the hypothesis in various contexts, you might generalize your findings into a broader theory. Okay, now let us discuss some steps for applying uh, theoretical reasoning to a research question. And let's break it down. Let's say we start with the research question, what is the return to education? This is quite broad and could include various types of returns, financial as well as non-financial. So, next step, the question is refined to focus specifically on the economic aspect, let's say. What is the economic return to the education? This makes the question more manageable and directs the inquiry towards measurable outcome like uh, return of education in the form of in income, higher income of course, uh, higher employment rates and eventually economic growth in the country. The next step, assessing current knowledge, asking what's the current state of knowledge. It involves uh, a literature review or an overview of existing research to understand what has already been established on this topic. And then the next step, we, we develop new knowledge. This step involves deciding how to approach the creation of new insights in, on the economic return to education. This could involve forming a theory, creating a hypothesis, forming a theory, for example, perhaps a general principle like higher education leads to higher lifetime earnings. This is the theory. Hypothesis, a testable statement based on the theory such as graduates with a college degree on 20 percent or more than those with only a high school diploma right next we would uh, gather the data that could support or refute the hypothesis for example we could conduct surveys we may uh, make use of existing databases or maybe we could uh, conduct some experimental studies and finally the testing phase analyzing the data to see if it supports the hypothesis and thereby the theory that we have propounded. So, can we summarize this relationship as a straight line? Yes. Here we have uh, E is equal to alpha plus beta times S. What they could mean? E is the dependent variable that uh, we are trying to explain or trying to predict. So, in the context we are discussing, in this context it is uh, economic return to education. So, E could represent an economic outcome such as earnings, hourly or monthly or whatever it might be. S here is the independent variable that uh, is believed to influence the dependent variable. S drives E. S is the dependent variable. In this context, it uh, might represent, let us see as we proceed, years of education or the level of uh, educational attainment. So, this represents our independent variable, years of education, 
this is our dependent variable that we are trying to predict. This part you see here is called alpha. This is the intercept parameter. It represents the value of E when S is 0 at this point. So, you may say that uh, it, it uh, is the baseline level of earnings without any education. If you have no education, this is at least what you are going to earn. So, that is alpha. What about this beta? Beta is the gradient of this line, uh, the slope parameter you may say. It indicates the amount of change in E earning that is associated with the one unit change in S. So, how do we estimate alpha and beta? To estimate the parameter alpha and beta, you would typically use your statistical methods such as ordinary least squares OLS regression if you are working with cross sectional data. So, what OLS does, let us say these are your observed values. OLS method minimizes the sum of the square differences between the observed values and the values predicted by the linear equation. So, this way we can find the line that best fits these data points. So, do you expect the relationship between E and S to be positive, negative or no relationship? Absolutely positive. The more years you spend in university, the higher earning you should expect. There is a clear positive relationship even without any statistical data on hand. It can be assumed as a common sense when you spend more time in university, you are likely to get a higher wage, higher salary, higher compensation. So, yes, there would be a positive correlation just like uh, your sales and advertisement. They have a positive correlation. When you spend more money on advertisement, you will have higher sales or your sales depends on the number of sales people you may have hired, sales executives. So, more sales staff given different sales target would mean you have higher sales. So, such variables that move in the same direction, they are said to have positive relationship with each other. See, 12 years in education schooling, your early earnings $16, 19 years $95 per hour. And as you keep on spending less, you earn less. 15 years, $28 per, per hour. So, so clearly there is a positive relationship uh, between uh, years in school and hourly earnings. So, now we can make a rough scatter plot of the data on E and S, which summarizes data on the individuals we just saw a little while ago in the previous slide. So, we have a, a dependent variable as y axis representing average monthly earnings E of each individual and uh, independent variable number of years spent by each individual in education. So, if you plot those uh, points given in the previous slide. So, here we go, we got uh, 11 dots or points on this uh, scatter plot. So, can we summarize the relationship as a straight line? Not a perfect straight line, but it is showing a positive relationship between uh, these two variables clearly. Regression analysis, the classical linear regression model OLS, that is the ordinary least squares. Uh, this is the method we use to find the parameters of the linear regression. So, this OLS model uh, we would use to test theories that uh, predict a linear relationship, for example, what we are discussing right now. Uh, an economic theory might suggest that education has a positive impact on earnings. You spend more time at a university, more years of education means you would have a higher per hour earning. So, so this model predicts that people with more education tend to earn more. Estimate the parameters alpha and beta using statistical techniques. The intercept parameter, this alpha, it represents the, the, the predicted value of uh, earnings when independent variable like in our example, the years of uh, education at university. When it is 0, this is the earning you get. And this gradient of this uh, line, the slope of 
this line is beta. So, what does it measure? What does it quantify? It quantifies change in the dependent variable R e for one unit change in the dependent variable that is years of education. So, this is the gradient of the line. Now, you can test whether the slope parameter beta is significantly different from 0. If it is, it would indicate that would indicate a significant relationship between E and S. That is the relationship between our independent, uh, sorry, independent and dependent variable. Okay, now what is empirical analysis? Empirical analysis uh, essentially is a way of gaining knowledge by direct or indirect observation. Uh, instead of just theorizing about how the world might work, empirical analysis involves going out and looking at the real world to see how it actually works. For example, if you wanted to understand if a new teaching method is effective, let us say. So, rather than just thinking about it theoretically, you would try it out with a group of students. As a teacher, as a trainer, I might test this directly on my students, collect data on their performance and then analyze the results to see if the new method I have used, did it really work? So, this process of conducting the experiment and analyzing the results is what you call the empirical analysis. Okay, types of data, primary and secondary. Primary data collected by the researcher, let us say the context we are studying right now is the relationship between earnings and years of education. So, if you were collecting prime data for this case, you would directly gather information from individuals about their education level and their earnings. So, this could involve interviews, this could involve surveys or experiments that you design and administer to, to sample the population. So, the data that you gather yourself, collect yourself is called the primary data. Secondary data on the other hand, you could just simply use uh, the data that has already been collected by someone else. Like in this example, national government statistical office data collected by them, you can use it. This might include census data, labor market surveys or tax records that contain information on individual education levels and their earnings. So, so primary data is that you gather yourself as a researcher and secondary data is the data that you make use of that has already been prepared by someone else. An important point to note here is that primary and secondary do not imply any ranking in terms of quality. So, they, they can both be good, they can both be bad. Uh, like for example, secondary data sometimes can be more reliable like national census. But sometimes secondary data might be outdated or maybe the data may not be relevant for the point of your investigation of your research. So, it depends upon which data might suit your specific circumstances. Like the case we are studying, I would say that the secondary data is more uh, suitable because it comes from a comprehensive source which includes vast amount of data uh, collected under standardized conditions. So, so depends upon the circumstances whether the primary would be more suitable or secondary. So, so rather it is more context based, right. So, it is more context based which might be more useful. So, the bottom line is the reliability of data depends on the context and how it was collected time series data. You have time on the x axis and probably the yearly earning on the y axis. So, so time series data that is the data on earnings and education that we currently consider collected at regular intervals over a period of time, let us say 20 years. So, average yearly earnings of individuals with varying level of education over the last 20 years. So, data reflecting the time, trend over time is called the time series data. Cross section data, data collected at one point in time. We discussed this in the previous slide uh, showing the earnings and education levels of different individuals could be snapshot of individual earnings and their years of uh, education in a given year. Then we have pooled cross section and time series data. This is a, a, a combined approach. It combines cross sectional data 
from different points in time. For example, uh, you might have a data on different individuals' earnings and their education levels from surveys that we have conducted every five years over a period of 20 years. So, it combines time series and cross-sectional data. Then we have balanced panel and unbalanced panel. This would mean the data on the same individual, balanced panel. The data on the same individual is earnings and education levels tracked over multiple time periods. An unbalanced panel, similar to balanced panel, but it allows for some, some missing data points, meaning some individuals may not be tracked at every point in time. So, the difference between these two is that uh, in balanced panel, no missing data points for any individual across the time span. But in balanced panel, some individuals may not be tracked at every point in time. Okay, the data that we gather, it may have some inaccuracies. There, there may be some uh, mistakes in it. First is the observational errors. Observational errors occur when there are mistakes in recording the data. So, in the context of earnings and education that we are discussing in this lecture, this might happen if, for example, the income level or years of schooling are incorrectly reported or incorrectly recorded. Next, errors of measurement. Uh, these are the inaccuracies in how data are quantified. For earnings and education example we are taking on, it could be due to ambiguities in what constitute education. Formal, vocational, informal, degree certificates, chartered accountancy, internal audit certifications, CPAs, CMAs, CFAs. See, there is ambiguity. They are, these are all education, but some are very, like CFA is one of the highest paid qualifications in uh, the world of finance, right? CPAs, certified professional accountants. So, what constitute education? There could be ambiguities. And at the same time, what could count as earnings? Is it hard earning made in cash or could it be like maybe you, you don't get paid in cash, but you are provided with a furnished accommodation with a very expensive car, uh, you're, you get education supplements for your children. So, so these are the payments in kinds, right? So, it could be the actual cash received as wages versus the total compensation. So, these ambiguities are what you call the errors of measurement. Non-response service or sometimes self-selection bias. People don't bother. They say, Khali wali. They don't reply to our our question. So, if, if certain individuals do not respond to a survey, the results may not be a representative of the entire population. So, so why they don't respond? Maybe they are running very less, so they feel embarrassed in giving response. So, this non-response can lead to self-selection bias. Those who earn higher wages, higher amounts of salaries, they are more likely to respond. And those who, unless they feel embarrassed, so they, they may not respond. So, this is uh, a source of inaccuracy. Sampling errors and or poor sampling methods. Yes, this is again an error. This happens when the sample is not representative of the population. So, we conducted a study and the study might only include college graduates, for example, which would, which would not accurately represent all levels of education. We need to see those who didn't, who didn't attend college. So, non-graduates should also be taken into the sample collection. Uh, next source of inaccuracy is aggregation problem. Let us discuss with a simple example. Imagine you put all kinds of fruits into one big basket and label it fruit. If someone wanted to know how many apples are in there, they couldn't tell you because everything is mixed up. So, that's like aggregation problem. When you group everyone earnings together by their education level, you can't see the differences between people who have the same level of education. Confidentiality and disclosure, the last in this list of sources of inaccuracy. Uh, we want to ensure confidentiality. So, this uh, might lead to data being reported in less details. We may have to withhold some data because we want to ensure confidentiality on people's earnings. For example, earnings being banded into ranges rather than the exact amount for individuals. So, this can reduce 
the precision of our analysis and hence a source of inaccuracy. So given a suitable data set, we could estimate the model or equation. This is the equation. Here this part tells us about the earnings of each person. This I uh, shows each individual. First individual, I would be replaced with 1 with years of education for person 1. For earnings for person 2 with his years of education is 2, right? So, so this represents the earnings of each person. S part is the years of education for each person we've discussed in detail. And this alpha and beta, these are what we are trying to find out using the data we have. Hypothesis testing. Uh, in the simplest terms, hypothesis testing is like uh, an experiment to see if what you think is true or not. For example, for example, uh, you might have a feeling that if a company is owned by private individuals, you mean private citizen, it's likely to make more money. And that is practically true. Private sector businesses, they do well. So, so this is my, my feeling, my hunch that a company that is owned by private individuals is likely to make more money. So, the beta in the formula from the OLS regression is like, is like a detective finding clues to prove if your feeling is right, if your hunch is right. If beta is positive, it's like the uh, finding that uh, companies with more private ownership do tend to make more money. If beta, beta is positive, that means uh, uh, the, the hypothesis is true. That means the private businesses, privately held businesses, they indeed make more money. And if further, if further beta is also statistically significant, which would mean it is not just by chance, you can be more sure about your feeling being right, that the privately owned businesses, they make more money. So how do we know if beta is positive and significant? Well. OLS regression model will do it for you, which of course I'm sure all of you know is a math tool that sorts through all the data and tells you whether the relationship you are interested in is in a, a, a strong, weak or just a fluke. Okay, so what are the assumptions of uh, the OLS regression model? OLS regression works well only if certain conditions are met. These are called assumptions. Imagine you are playing a board game. You need to follow the rules to make sure the game is fair. So, same is true with OLS. You need to make sure the assumptions uh, hold true. So, your findings are fair and accurate. So, you will learn about these rules and assumptions in more details in the future. Okay, let us apply hypothesis testing to the case we are discussing. Think of hypothesis testing like conducting a science fair experiment to see if something you believe might be true. In our example, earnings and education, for example. So, if you get a positive beta value from your math work, OLS regression, it's like experiment showing that more education is associated with higher earnings. And uh, significantly positive means, significant positive means, we can trust the results of our experiment. And they are not just an happening by random chance. It's like being sure that it's not just a lucky guess. So, it's like more education leads to higher earnings. And that's what we have been talking about for the last one hour probably. So, if the assumptions of OLS model hold, we can use the results to do what? If we play by the rules of our special calculator, the OLS model, for our education and earnings experiment, and everything checks out, we can do some cool things with what we learn. We can make predictions about the effect of the ownership changes on profitability. Just like a weather forecast, we can predict how likely it is that more education will lead to higher pay for people. Informed theory. It's like adding a new chapter to a textbook, telling future learners the story about education and money. You, uh, you get more education, 
you are likely to earn more money. Inform business strategy. This could help companies decide if they want to pay for their employees' education. Of course, think it might lead to better business because their employees could earn more and be happier at work. Hence, their, their productivity would, in, would increase. Inform economic policy. It's like giving advice to the government or those in the decision-making role on whether they should encourage people to study more to improve the country's overall growth. If, if, if this is dependable model, let's say, and we are able to prove to some significant level that education leads to higher earnings, that would push decision-makers and governments to encourage people to study more so those people can improve not only their lives but as well the country's overall wealth. Next we have correlation and uh, causality. Uh, let us discuss this with the help of an example. I hope it would make more sense. Think of regression analysis as being uh, like noticing that ice cream sales when they go up, the number of sunburns go up. It can be statistically proved. Yes, they are correlated. It might look like buying ice cream causes sunburns, but actually they both just happen to go up when it is sunny and more people are at the beach. So in our study of education and earnings, even if we see that people with more education tend to earn more money, it does not mean for sure that the education is what's causing the higher earnings. Maybe people who go to school longer also have other advantages. Maybe they have rich parents, they have inherited a lot of money. Like maybe they have better connections or better health. So, so we can develop correlation between education and uh, earnings, just like there is a correlation between ice cream sales and sunburns. There is a connection, there is a pattern, but it does not prove one thing is directly causing the other. There is correlation, but there may not be causation. And what is the cause, by the way? The cause is hot weather. Ice cream sales goes up when it's hot, and there are more sunburns when the weather is hot. So the causation may be hidden. We, we may have to think about other reasons and theories that might explain why the ice cream and sunburns are correlated. So this is causation. This is causation. And correlation when two variables move together either in the same direction or in the opposite direction. So although regression analysis deals with the dependence of one variable, in our case earnings, on other variables like years of studies at a university, it does not necessarily imply causation. Like a statistical relationship between sunburns and uh, ice cream sale, strong, how strong and however suggestive can never establish causal, causal connection. So our ideas of causation must come from outside statistics. We know that sunburns are caused by hot weather. Increase in sales is caused by hot weather and sunburns In ice cream sales, yes, they are correlated, but for causation, we have to look outside statistics. Use common sense, why they are correlated. That's the idea. Uh, statistical concepts and measures. Okay, why, 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 why? Why do we have to bother with statistics? The question. Well, think of statistics as the toolkit for making sense of a bunch of numbers. We have numbers and you just want to make some sense out of those numbers. Like if we want to figure out if more school lead to making more money, we can't just guess. We need tools. We need tools to help us see the real story of the numbers, what the story numbers are telling. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, where OLS comes in. That's where ordinarily square comes in. It's like a special tool, a magnifying glass that helps us look closely at the numbers to see if there is a pattern. Like whether people who studied more years at a university are likely to earn higher salaries and how strong this pattern is. That's, that's the, the cause, that's the reason why are we 
taking statistics seriously. Why are we taking OLS seriously? OLS relies on statistical theory. Yes, it does. In particular, probability theory and, and statistical inference. We will need to be familiar with these terms because OLS is based on some some fancy math ideas like probability and making good guess based on evidence. We have to get uh, comfortable with these uh, concepts, with these ideas, so that we can use our magnifying glass more effectively. This way, we are not just making uh, wild guesses, rather we are making a smart guess based on what the numbers talk, what the numbers show us, what the numbers speak of under our magnifying glass. What is the basic idea of probability, like what's the probability of uh, getting ahead when you toss a coin? Of course, one out of two. Or when the dice roll, or a company having a rate of return on capital greater than a certain x, x bar, for example. So, probability is a sub-discipline of mathematics. Probability Theory is like the science of maybes. Maybes. It helps us figure out the chances that something will happen. So, it's a part of math that tells us how likely it is that you will get heads when you flip a coin or you roll a six on a die or how likely it is that the company will make more money than average for its industry. So, if a coin is tossed repeatedly, it will take a particular statistical pattern and that's what you call the probability distribution or a die is rolled a number of times we get a probability distribution of getting a one or two or three or four or five or six so so when we look at our case of how education might affect earnings probability theory helps us understand things like the chance that someone with a college degree will earn a certain amount of money so we want to use probability to assess what are the chances that a person who has spent some time in the university, what chances are that he's going to earn a certain amount of money. It tells us that while we, we can't predict exactly what one person will earn, we can predict the pattern for a large number of people if we have enough information about it. That is the probability distribution all about. We are going to cover this in detail as you go along studying statistics. So these probability distribution describe the theoretical frequency distribution of a variable based on many trials. You flip a coin 100 times or you roll a die 500 times. So, these probability distributions are like big charts that show us all the possible outcomes of something and how often each outcome is expected to happen if we do something over and over again. So, they are like a, a, a weather report for numbers, like a weather report predicting the chance of rain a probability distribution predicts the chance of different things happening, like uh, how many times you're likely to get a head when the the, 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 the corn is tossed 100 times, or what is the probability of getting a 6 when you roll a die for 500 times, let's say. So, we can use probability distribution to calculate the probability that a variable will take on a specific value. Like, for example, if you uh, throw a coin 100 times, Chances are that you will get uh, head 50 times, approximately, and, and tail 50 times. Then these are the two possibilities, either head or tail. So, when this experiment is repeated many times, maybe thousands or one million times, you are more likely to see this, this uh, equilibrium 50-50%. Uh, but in our case, with education and earnings, a probability distribution can help us predict how likely it is that someone with a certain level of education will earn a certain amount of money. It's a bit like uh, guessing the average height of people in a city by looking at the lots of different people heights and figuring out which heights are most common. So, this is how probability distribution work out. So, uh, this is a very useful theoretical tool that is exploited in regression analysis. Yes, these charts are super handy in our maths detective work OLS regression because they help us understand and make good guesses about how education and earnings are linked for lots of people. All right, so now we want to analyze our data and for our data analysis, we have some tools. Let us discuss them briefly. First set of tools measure the 
measures of central tendency. They are like uh, finding the most popular or common points in our data. Mean. This is the average if you add up everyone earnings and divide by the number of people. Let's say we have uh, three people we are studying, A, B, C, and their annual earnings. Let's say 10K, 15K, and let's say uh, another 10K. So, what is their average salary? 10, 15, 25 plus 10, 35.3. So, the mean is 11,667. Mean is the average, simply adding up the earnings of everyone under consideration, three people, and dividing by the number of people. If there are four people, four salaries divided by four, five salaries divided by five, that is mean. Mod is the most common earnings amount. Like in our example, the most common is 10,000. The number you see the most, that is called mod. And median is that if you arrange the numbers in ascending order or in descending order, the middle number would be the median. So if you line this up, you have got 10,000, 10,000, and 15,000. So the mid number, the middle value is called the median. Lowest to highest, so the mid value would be your median. So these are the three tools under the measures of central tendency. Then measure of dispersion. This, these tell you how spread out the earnings are. Do most people earn about the same or are some people earning a lot more than others or a lot less than others? For this, we have three further sub-tools. Range. This is the difference between the lowest and highest earning. Let's say we have a set of 12 people. Of them, one earns $10,000 per year. Another one of these group earns $50,000 per annum. So the difference between the Lowest and highest earnings is what you call the range or any other parameter, whatever it be. Variance. Variance, this shows how much the earnings differ from the average. If you take average, like in the previous example, our average was uh, 11,667. And there were three numbers for three individuals, 10, 10, and 15. So, variance shows how much the earnings differ from the average. A big variance means people's earnings are all over the place. They are much scattered. There is more deviations in the earnings. Standard deviation is simply the square root of variance. Whatever you got here, if you take the square root of the variance, it's called standard deviation. So this is like uh, average distance from the average earnings. This tells you on average how different each person's earnings are from the mean earnings. This is what we have already done. The average or mean is attained by summing up all observations. In our case, the salary of those three individuals and dividing by the number of observations. We have done it. Uh, consider these are the values given 22, 40, 53 and adding all these up, dividing with 11. That's your mean. Average. Okay. Now, what if this is the ungrouped data? What if we have a group data? What do we do in that case? Now we have frequency distribution. We have got classes. The last 11 months, uh, we sold 8 cars in 1 month, 15 cars in 1 month. We sold 22 cars in 3 months over a total of 11 months. Now, if you want to calculate the average, so what you are going to do in this case, you are going to multiply 8 times 1 plus 15 times 1 plus 16 times 1 and then adding all the result. 263 cars sold over a period of 11 months. So, if you calculate the average, 263 upon 11 gives you 23.9. Of course, you can't sell <laughs> cars in partial parts like this way. So, it's approximately 24 cars per month. That is the mm -hmm. average over the last 11 months. We can uh, represent this data in histogram also. So 5 to 10, that's 8 falls within this. Then 10 to 15, we sold one car again. From 15 to 20, we got two. So this way, this is the histogram we get. See? The mod. The mod is the most frequently occurring observation. Or it is the tallest bar in the frequency distribution. This one. So, 
So the mod is like the favorite choice or the most popular item in a list. If you're looking at how many times a certain number shows up, the mod is the number you see the most often. It's like you ask a bunch of kids their favorite ice cream flavor and most of them say chocolate. So then chocolate is the mod. That is the most popular or most frequent choice. Frequency distribution may be unimodal or bimodal or multimodal depending on the data. Unimodal, this is when there is one clear favorite, one mod. Like if chocolate is the stand, standout favorite ice cream, that's unimodal. Bimodal or multimodal, this is when you have uh, two or more numbers that are tied for being seen the most. It's like having chocolate and vanilla both as top favorite flavors. The data set from field below has multiple mods. Why? Because uh, as the data set shows, it looks like there is no mod because every number shows up only once. So there is no clear favorite. Each number is like a different flavor of ice cream that only one kid likes. So there is no winner for the most popular. And so we may say that all observations are mods, so multiple mods. Consider the data on sales of cars per month for 11 months. We discussed this already. So, the mod is 22. Why? Because that is the largest sales or the highest frequency in the frequency distribution. The normal distribution. What you see on the screen is a normal distribution. So, it's a fancy term for that bell-shaped curve we talk about in statistics. So, if you are measuring something like how tall people are, or how fast their heart speed, and you have a lot of data that is tied up in the middle of the graph. A bimodal distribution would have two mods, uh, which appear as two peaks. The median is the mid score. If we rank these scores in order of magnitude, this is the middle number. We already discussed this previous range is already discussed as the difference between the lowest and highest values of variable. Now, what we can also look at is the interquartile range. Let me show you what it is. If you arrange your data in ascending order and slice it up in four equal parts, this part ending the first chunk represents 25% of the data, 50%, 75%, and 100%. This is called the lower quartile. This is the upper quartile representing 75% of the data. The difference between the lower and upper quartile is called interquartile range and it is also one of the measures of dispersion to see how spread out the data is. It says the lower quartile is the mid score between minimum and the median. Exactly, this is another way of looking at it. The minimum and median, the midpoint between these two is called lower quartile, which is of course 25% of your data. Upper quartile is the mid score between the median and the maximum. This is the median, this is the maximum, and this, this midpoint is the upper quartal. And the difference between these two is what you call the interquartile range. Probability distributions, we discussed this briefly previously. Uh, given a data set of scores with common shape, we could accurately calculate the probability of any given score occurring using an idealized probability frequency distribution or probability distribution. All right, when we have a bunch of numbers like test scores or heights or the amount of ice cream someone eats, we can use a probability distribution to figure out how likely it is to get any particular number. The most common shape for this kind of thing is the normal distribution, which you might have heard Previously, I've just discussed bell-shaped curve. It's shaped like a bell, and most of the numbers cluster around the middle. Let me show you. It is shaped like a bell, and most of the numbers cluster around the middle. So if you're looking at test scores, the bell curve tells you that most students will score around the middle. Around the middle. And fewer students score at very low or very high. These are the two tails of the bell curve. So if we have a very large sample or data for entire population for variables that are normally distributed like height 
called Pearl Strait. So when you plot this data, it will take a shape of a curve. Some people will have a short height, some will be very tall, but the, the bulk would be in the middle, the average height. So it says that 68% uh, of all observations in a normal distribution lie within one standard deviation from the mean. What does it exactly mean? Let me show you. This is the mean. 68% of all the stuff you are measuring will fall within one standard deviation from the mean. Plus 1D, minus 1 standard deviation. That is 34% to the right, 34% to the left gives you a total of 68%. So about 68% of all the observations will fall within standard one standard deviation from the mean. And about 98% observations will fall between two standard deviations from the mean. So this is a very useful for us because it tells us that most things we measure, like the example height or pulse rate, tend to tend to hover around an average value, and and fewer are really high and fewer are very low. So this graph is a quick way to see how common or rare certain values are based on how far they are from the mean. Very high, very low and bulk is in the center.